class. Welcome to chapter four, uh, where we're going to talk about some of the ways that we culture and visualize cell, which is essential for studying uh, molecular biology. So what's the, the why and the how of culturing and visualizing cells? Well, animal cells grow in culture when you supply them with the nutrients that they would normally get from blood or, or growing within an organism. Um, but you also have to supply them with an appropriate 2D or 3D substrate uh, for them to grow upon. Um, primary cells have a finite lifespan, um, but transformed tumor cells as well as cell lines like stem cells, they can grow indefinitely. Uh, there are ways to sort cells. Um, one such way is this fluorescence activated cell sorter or FACS um, that you can sort cells that you've labeled. Um, and this is usually done with uh, um, fluorescent tags like GFP. Um, hybridoma cells uh, produce monoclonal antibodies that bind one antigen epitope and are used for basic research and therapeutics. We'll get into that a little bit. Uh, basic biological processes can be studied using genetic manipulation or drugs to infer which specific, uh, to, sorry, interfere with specific cell components. Um, so it's important um, if we're going to look at uh, drug development um, or genetics uh, to use cell lines, that way we don't have to use uh, uh, people right away if these drugs are unproven. And large scale chemical libraries can be screened for compounds that target specific processes. So at the time of this lecture right now, um, we're going through the uh, coronavirus uh, uh, pandemic. And so when they start looking at drugs that can um, mitigate uh, the coronavirus or uh, antibiotics and things of that nature, uh, these large uh, libraries of, of therapeutics can be screened um, using these cell lines to make sure that there's no adverse effect on human cells. So isolated animal or human cells are cultured in a nutrient-rich liquid, which we call culture media. Um, and you also have to use specifically coated plastic dishes uh, in, in a flask or an incubator uh, under controlled temperatures. They've got to be similar to body temperatures and it has to have uh, the proper atmosphere and humidity conditions for them to grow. These culture media supplies, uh, or this culture media supplies essential amino acids that aren't typically synthesized by the cell. These are amino acids that you get from food and things of that nature. Um, but also the media uh, supplies vitamins, uh, minerals such as salts, uh, fatty acid and glucose, um, which obviously would be uh, given to the cells through, um, through food, um, as well as blood serum, which contain uh, protein factors such as hormones and growth factors, uh, HGH, human growth factor, things like that. Um, and most animal cells only thrive when attached to an extracellular matrix. Um, so this is that uh, 2D or 3D substrate that they have to kind of grow around. And if you've taken my development class, you know that um, uh, neighboring cells play a uh, large part in, uh, in how cells divide and develop. Um, so having this 3D structure um, is essential in some cases. So uh, some isolate, uh, isolated cells die and others grow for a limited number of generations, about uh, roughly 50 generations um, of harvesting. So as you can see here, we have this initial growth rate, and then we have this kind of uh, sustained phase. And then after a certain number of cell generations, you start to see senescence uh, of the culture. Um, but very rarely, uh, cells can accumulate uh, oncogenic mutations, similar to cancer, uh, that allow them to survive and continue dividing until their progeny overgrow the culture. And this creates what we call an immortal uh, cell line, and it will grow indefinitely as long as you appropriately uh, dilute them and you don't let them get you know, too big for their, uh, their vessel or their, their culture dish, um, and as long as you feed them nutrients. So there is a specific cell line um, called HELA, H-E-L-A, um, and this line was established back in 1952 uh, from a malignant uterine cervix carcinoma tumor. Uh, 
Um, and that cell line is immortal, so it will continue to reproduce as long as you feed it and as long as you uh, give it proper spacing. Um, and that, that cell line is still used today. A very cool uh, bit of machinery that allows us to sort cells is that fax, the fluorescent activated cell sorter. And this separates cells based on different levels of fluorescence. So for example, if we were to fluorescently tag um, liver cells in this uh, complex mixture that we're growing, we would be able to sort them out from, say, surrounding connective tissue, or if we want to be more specific and look at just the epidermal cells of the heart versus, uh, uh, or the outermost layer of the heart versus valve tissue or something of that nature, we can get very specific and then sort uh, cells in that way. And so the way that this works is that uh, this labeled cell mixture um, is mixed with sheath fluid, it's called. It's a buffer solution. And they'll pass single file through this nozzle right here and they will go in front of this laser beam. And the fluorescent light emitted from the, the excitation from that laser beam, as well as the amount of light that is scattered by each cell is measured by a detector. And that's used to determine the cell shape and the cell size. And so once uh, the cells are forced through a nozzle, they form these tiny droplets that contain at most one single cell. So it's a very, very, very tiny nozzle that they're going single file through. And each droplet obtains a negative electric charge that's proportional to the amount of fluorescence that the cell is giving off. So once these cells have that charge, they pass through an electric field, uh, which is right here. Um, and they are differentially deflected based on their charge into different bins. So uh, we have our droplets that didn't have a charge get sorted out. And then our droplets that have a lesser charge get sorted into one bin. And our droplets that have a greater charge get sorted into another based on their charge, right? So um, the electric field pushes greater negative charge further away, so they go into a different bin than the ones with lesser uh, electric charge. And so once that's done, we have uh, this kind of monoculture of cells that are sorted that are all the same type. Um, and in this case, we have two different types that are sorted uh, out from one another. And then from there, um, these cells can either be cultured or we can do some sort of genomics or transcriptomic studies where we look at uh, DNA or RNA expression or things of that nature. If we were to look at this in practice and look at some data from it, um, there's an experiment here where we were looked at where the researchers looked at T cells that were bound to fluorescently tagged antibodies. Um, and these antibodies were looking for two different cell surface proteins that we can separate out. Um, and these cell specific proteins were on white blood cells. So T cells express both uh, CD3 and uh, THY 1.2 or thymine uh, 1.2 proteins, um, and they're not these are not expressed by by other cell types. So we want to separate out only white blood cells and not the red blood cells. Uh, so mouse spleen cells uh, were labeled with a red fluorescent um, monoclonal antibody, which is specific for that CD3 surface uh, protein, and in addition, uh, a green fluorescent antibody was used to identify uh, THY 1.2. So the figure here shows uh, this analysis uh, of the red, which was the CD3, uh, and the green, uh, which was the THY 1.2 fluorescent intensities of each cell. So each dot represents one cell. So the T cells expressing both CD3 and THY 1.2 proteins on their surface um, is this quadrant right here, which represents T cells, which we we're looking for. Um, and this comprised about 50% of the cells found within the spleen. The cells that exhibited very low red and very low green fluorescent um, uh, excitation 
express only background levels of these, so they have just a little bit. Um, and these are other types of white blood cells. These are non-T cells that we're looking for. So by having antibodies that fluoresce, that attach to our specific cell uh, surface proteins, you're able to use this fax machine to sort out the T cells that we desire uh, to further study and get rid of all the non-T cells and all the everything else <laughs> that's in this uh, cell suspension. Um, so it's an interesting way to be able to isolate uh, certain cells from complex mixtures. So there are a lot of uh, different drugs that are used in biological uh, research and cell specific biological research um, that we know their function. Um, and we've kind of classified these into these broad categories um, such as uh, DNA replication inhibitors. Um, so we have uh, these drugs that we know will prevent DNA from replicating. Uh, transcription inhibitors, so there'll be no more proteins made. Um, compounds that affect the cytoskeleton, so they disrupt the uh, actin uh, cytoskeleton. We have drugs that uh, inhibit uh, kinases, and remember um, kinases are the ones that add uh, those phosphate groups to proteins then you can turn on and turn off proteins. Um, and so there's a lot of these compounds uh, that we know, but we also have these giant libraries of different chemicals that we don't know exactly what they do, but they can be used through these in these high throughput screens to see if we could uh, use them for medicinal purposes. Um, so, uh, for example, at University of Mississippi, there is this um, Natural Product Research Center, and what they do is they take a whole bunch of, of plants from around the world. And what they do with those plants, they have this giant library down in the basement. And what they do with those plants is they um, extract different compounds that are novel um, to these different plants. And then they can use these high put, throughput screens to see if these novel compounds may eventually uh, provide some medical benefit. Um, and so naturally occurring drugs and antibodies have been used uh, in medicine for centuries. Um, for example, um, Colchicin uh, is this uh, meadow saffron uh, plant, and that's been used to treat, uh, treat gout for years and years. And so um, there's a lot of drugs that we still haven't discovered yet out in nature um, that these high throughput screens uh, may be able to help us figure out what to use them for. So here's an example of that screening process. So in this screen, they're looking for drugs that inhibit mitosis. And the reason for that would be to inhibit cell division, which is uh, out of control with cancer, right? So cells were exposed to uh, 16,000 plus different chemicals in a chemical library, some of the, the one that I said was at University of Mississippi. Um, and this is screened with a robotic high throughput immunofluorescent microscope. Uh, and it, with an antibody uh, that tags tubulin, so the uh, polymer that leads to those spindle fibers and uh, mitosis. And um, what they're looking for is abnormal spindle morphology. So they want to see if this chemical causes those spindle fibers that uh, lead to uh, mitosis, if that chemical disrupts that in any way. So uh, in our uh, microscope images here. The localization of tubulin is shown in green and the chromosomes or the DNA is in blue. Um, and so in an untreated cell, this is what we see. So we can see that the spindle fibers are attaching on opposite sides of the cell and they are going to pull apart those, uh, those sister chromatids um, to go through the process of uh, mitotic division and reproduce. Um, and then in the second case, um, the, treat, the drug treatment, you see this aberrant spindle fiber and segregation of um, the chromosomes. And so this would be a potential drug that may eventually uh, 
treat cancer. So another very important uh, aspect of visualizing cells is light microscopy. Um, light microscopy uh, has limited resolution, which is based on light wavelength. Um, but there are super resolution microscopes that are, um, are new and, and being developed that increase this effective resolution. Um, so the light microscopy of cells is enhanced by exploiting differences in refractive index, as well as staining and fluorescent labels. Um, like we saw in the last slide, that uh, fluorescently labeled cells, you can uh, identify certain parts of the cell based on these fluorescent tags, um, as well as with dyes, or GFP and um, different fusion proteins. Uh, there's deconvolution, confocal, and uh, TIRF microscopy that, in, that greatly improve fluorescent imagey, imaging. Um, and fluorescent recovery of photobleaching uh, and Forster uh, resonance energy transfer, or FRET, uh, reveal molecular mobility and interaction dynamics. So you've pro probably all had experience with optical microscopes at this point uh, in your labs or if you volunteer in a lab, uh, etc. Um, and so in a typical uh, uh, compound uh, light microscope, uh, the specimen is usually mounted on a transparent glass slide, uh, which we would have right there. And it's positioned on this movable uh, specimen stage. And then there are several lenses to magnify the specimen. Um, and so the total magnification, which is usually up to uh, 1000x, is a product of the magnif uh, magnification of these individual lenses. Um, and the objective lens uh, closest to the specimen uh, and the projection lens uh, that focus the image on the camera are what make up that 1000-fold uh, magnification. So uh, you're familiar with those, but let's talk about some of these other um, types of microscopes. So a uh, bright field uh, microscope, which we have at the top here, um, <clears throat> the light from a tungsten lamp is focused on the specimen. So we have our light source here, and it bounces off a mirror, and then these condenser lens focus that light onto uh, the specimen. Uh, specimen. And they, we usually stain these with dyes to kind of enhance the contrast uh, of the tissues or whatever we're looking at. Uh, and then a uh, condenser lens will or we'll focus on the specimen, and then this uh, objective lens and projection lens will allow the light to be refocused uh, into the objective or whatever you are uh, looking at uh, or recording the image with, whether it's with your eye or with a, a camera. Um, in phase contrast, which is the second type here, um, this increases the contrast of uh, biological specimens, and the incident light passes through a um, annular or an, yes, annular diaphragm, which focuses uh, a circular annulus, uh, which is uh, here's the annular uh, diaphragm, um, and it, so that ring of light, this annulus of light, is focused on the specimen, uh, which is right there. Um, light passes through uh, unobstructed through the specimen, and then is focused focused again by the objective lens and onto the thick gray ring of the phase plate, which is right here. Uh, and that phase plate will absorb some of the direct light and it alters its phase by one quarter of the wavelength. So that plate just kind of messes with the wavelength of light just by one quarter of a single wavelength. Uh, so if the specimen refracts or bends uh, the light because of the refractive index of this phase plate's material. Uh, the phase of some waves is altered and the wave uh, and those lights pass through uh, the clear region of the plate, which is in the center there. And the reflected, refracted and unrefracted light is then recombi recombined onto the image plate uh, where you get your image. And so what this is doing is it's uh, sharpening uh, the focus or the features um, that are present on whatever you're looking at. Um, so it's bending light um, in, in different ways and then recombining it to get very sharp images is the, I guess, 
uh, best way to put it. Um, and then lastly, we have fluorescent microscopy. Um, and this is where a beam of light from a mercury lamp, which is on the side here, um, is directed uh, to through an excitation filter. So we have a light source, and then we have this filter that only lets a certain wavelength of light through. So in this example, we have green light that is being directed through. And so that light will then be uh, reflected off a uh, dich uh, dichroic mirror and through an objective lens. So our green light is uh, reflected off that mirror through a lens onto our specimen, which is right down here. Uh, the fluorescent light emitted by the specimen, uh, so we have our excitation uh, light source, and then we have the light that is reflected by whatever chromophores that are in our dyes or fluorescent dye on the specimen. So that light is then uh, passes up through our lens and through the uh, dichroic mirror to our image plate. So what we're doing is we're sending in one wavelength of light, reflecting it down to the specimen. The chromophores on the specimen will change, they take in that wavelength of light and change it to a different color. That color then passes to the image plate and we can see that color. So only things that have that chromophore or that fluorescent label are going to show up. So let's look at the same <clears throat> cells imaged in three different uh, techniques. So the first we have here is uh, bright field, which was our first example, um, which is just kind of a modified light microscopy. And you can see it's kind of a little fuzzy, um, but you get a decent image. Um, the second here is phase contrast, and that's where we kind of modify the wavelength by one quarter wavelength, and then recombine the images. And as you can see, there's a lot more contrast. You can and really uh, resolve some of these finer structures. And the last is, uh, is uh, differential uh, interference contrast microscopy, which we didn't really talk about the methods for. But as you can see, that gives us uh, kind of more of a cell surface uh, uh, image of the cells as opposed to the penetrating um, uh, phase contrast images that we have. So when we do light microscopy, uh, we generally fix the tissue and embed them into a solid medium and then cut these very thin sections. Um, the tool that we do this with is uh, called a microtome. Um, and what this allows, if we were, for instance, looking at, want to look at the inside of liver tissue, um, if we were to just take a hunk of liver tissue and uh, try to do light microscopy on it, you just see the outside of the cells. Uh, so what we have to do is cut very thin sections where the light can penetrate through and we're able to see uh, the inside or the very fine uh, inner structures of this tissue. And so there are a myriad of different stains um, that can be used uh, to uh, kind of highlight different cellular aspects, whether those cells, for example, in plant tissues, look at chitin or um, look at cellulose or things of that nature. And in human tissues, you might have something that's uh, muscle related, like a myosin stain or uh, within the cell, actin stains. Uh, we talked about tubulin stains for those spindle fibers earlier. So slicing them very thin and then staining them differential, uh, differentially allows us to look at uh, different components that we're interested in. So an immunofluorescent microscopy, which is the most widely used method for detecting specific protein localization, an antibody is covalently attached to a fluorescent dye and it's used to stain uh, the cell tissue mixture, uh, which is fixed with a chemical crosslinker to ensure, to ensure that the components remain in place. Um, so we don't want to uh, stain stuff and then have it all move around and jumble up, etc. Um, and then the tissue is also uh, treated uh, with a non-ionic detergent, which allows uh, the membranes, uh, they become uh, permeable and allows these antibodies to get inside the cells and access the cell components. 
in this example here, uh, the cell was stained with a green fluorescing dye uh, that is specifically bound to a mitochondria um, antibody and a red fluorescent dye that is specifically incorporated into lysosomes. So we can see the mitochondria in the lysosomes here. Um, and then the image is uh, processed um, using a computer program to kind of deconvolute and, and, and stack the red and the green images on top of each other. So <clears throat> double label fluorescent microscopy can visualize the relative distribution of two different proteins. So in this double label fluorescent microscopy, each protein is labeled with a different fluorochrome uh, to compare the localizations. And so a fixed and permeable uh, cell culture is incubated with rhodamine labeled uh, phalloidin, which is uh, red in this case, and it specifically binds to actin. And then uh, a rabbit antibody that reacts to tubulin which is the major, major component of the microtubules, uh, is added, which is followed by a fluorescently labeled secondary uh, antibody, which is specific to that rabbit antibody. So it's a goat antibody that binds to that original rabbit antibody um, that is labeled with uh, green fluorescent uh, proteins is added to the mixture. The reason we do that is because um, we want to increase the signal of the green. So the primary antibody, which is the rabbit antibody that reacts to the microtubule, will bind, and then that secondary antibody, the goat anti-rabbit that is labeled green, multiple of those will bind to that primary uh, rabbit antibody, and it will increase the signal that way. So as you can see here, uh, we have the two uh, fluorescent images. We have the green, which was the rabbit, uh, then the goat anti-rabbit that had green fluorophore on it. Uh, and then we have the red that was the actin-specific dye. And we can overlay these two images and we can see the distribution of actin uh, as well as uh, the tubulin uh, within the cell in uh, relation to one another. So there's a lot of different uh, fluorescent labels that we can incorporate in these studies. Um, so as you can see here, you've got over a dozen uh, different colors that you can label um, and label multiple different components and overlay them to kind of get a, uh, a good idea or an image of what is going on in the cell and the localization of multiple cellular components. A good artist with a lot of time on their hands uh, used multiple different uh, bacterial colonies that all expressed these different um, uh, fluorescent proteins to kind of give an idea of how these different proteins uh, fluoresce and uh, how they're uh, cell specific. So each of these different colors is a different bacteria that is expressing one of these different uh, fluorescent proteins. So another type of microscopy, deconvolution fluorescent microscopy, uh, yields high resolution optical sections that can be reconstructed to create uh, a single 3D image. And conventional fluorescent microscopy uh, is limited by out of focus light from fluorescent labels above and below the plane of focus. So if you can imagine uh, when you use just a regular microscope, uh, you can focus on something, but there are things uh, further and things closer that are out of focus. And this is also a problem in fluorescent microscopy. And those things appear, appear as kind of these blurred images that we see uh, in pane A here. So um, this is especially a problem in thicker specimens. So if we're not using a microtome to make thin sections, um, that fluorescent, uh, those fluorescent uh, fluorophores can be deeper or closer than that field of focus. So what uh, deconvolution microscopy does is it uh, calculates this point spread function, uh, which is this uh, algorithm that uh, focuses, uh, or it gets rid of out of focus light and computationally removes fluorescence that is contributed by these out of focus parts. So it's able to detect when something looks uh, like this and it's blurry and remove it uh, from the image. And so uh, 
then it does this three-dimensional reconstruction of the raw image. Um, and in this example here, we have a uh, macrophage cell that is stained with uh, DAPI, which is a DNA stain uh, that is blue. It's hard to see here. It's inside the, uh, uh, the nucleus there. Uh, a microtubule stain that is green, and then an actin stain that is, uh, appears red. And so application of this deconvolution algorithm to the image uh, clarifies uh, the fibrillar organization of microtubules and the localization of actin. So what it's doing is getting rid of all the out-of-focus parts and then reconstructing things with everything that is in focus. So confocal microscopy is a technique that uh, allows uh, production of in-focus uh, optical sections, um, specifically in thicker cells. So a conventional fluorescent microscope uh, image of the mitotic spindle um, from a sea urchin is shown here on the uh, left-hand side. Um, and this was labeled uh, with a tubulin antibody and a fluorescently tagged secondary antibody um, and it caused this blur um, because there are uh, fluorophores in the background uh, that are uh, fluorescing and causing uh, this blur because it's not in the focal plane. So in the confocal microsco uh, microscope image, um, the fluorescence is detected only from the molecules that are in the focal plane, um, which generate a very thin optical uh, section. And so uh, what happens is um, it ignores, kind of like our previous example, it ignores the out-of-focus um, wavelength and only collects wavelength that is from the focal plane. And so even with thick tissue, you're able to get these sharper images. Total internal reflection fluorescence, or TIRF microscopy, um, is best for fluorescence imaging uh, in a thin focal plane adjacent to the surface. So only about 50 to 100 nanometers of the specimen adjacent to the cover slip, uh, which is uh, right here, our specimen in water, and our cover slip is right here. Um, uh, only 50 to 100 nanometers of it is illuminated, and that is done by directing light at an angle um, at which most of it is reflected from the uh, glass water interface uh, of the cover slip rather than passing through it. So because we are uh, using this excitation beam and directing it at an angle, most of the light is refracted away except for in this small band uh, right here. And so what that does uh, is it gets rid of that background fluorescence that we see as a problem uh, in some of our other fluorescent imaging techniques. So here we can see uh, the results of that. So we have our normal fluorescent image up here. And if we were to look at the TIRF image, we see that uh, we have much narrower, narrower section uh, where we don't have this kind of background glob that we have uh, in the fluorescent image. And um, we can use computer programs to overlay these two images and stain them uh, digitally uh, two different colors. And we can see then the closer microtubules uh, that we identified with the TIRF, as well as the normal uh, fluorescent microtubules um, that were identified with a normal uh, fluorescent microscopy. Um, and so we can kind of get a depth to the image to see what's closer and what's further away. So another fluorescent microscopy technique is called FRAP, which is fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching. Um, and this is kind of a cool experiment where we take a cell and we stain it uh, with our fluorescent uh, marker. So here we have kind of a green GFP uh, or something. Um, and what we do then is say that GFP is staining for a molecule of interest within the cell. And we want to see the mobility uh, of that uh, molecule. And so what we can do is use a very high-powered laser to 
photo bleach or destroy the chromophores in a small section of that cell. So we have this black circle where we've taken a laser and just blasted away all the uh, stain. And what we do then is take successive images, we turn the laser off to make sure it's not continuing to uh, photo bleach, um, and then we can continue to take images over time. So um, here we have uh, seconds after the photo bleaching event where we see that molecules that were um, not photo bleached move in to fill in that photo bleached section. And so we can quantify that to see how fast these molecules are diffusing throughout uh, the cell. So what if we want to know how or if two proteins interact with each other? Well, what we can use is this uh, technique called FRET, not FRAP that we talked about before, but FRET, which is a force to resonance energy transfer. And so the way that this works is we have our protein that we uh, know about of interest, protein X, and it is fused to this uh, cyan fluorescent protein. We also have our uh, protein that we are predicting as a binding partner, and that is protein Y, and that is fused to a yellow fluorescent protein. Now, we can excite our sample with 433 nanometer excitation light. So when we do this, the YF or the CFP, the cyan fluorescent protein, fluoresces and it emits a wavelength of 475 nanometers. And so that is the cyan color that we see. But if X and Y bind together, then when we excite it with 433 nanometers, the 475 nanometers, that fluorescent cyan color, instead will excite the yellow fluorescent protein, and then we get a 530 nanometer fluorescence. So we get a yellow color. If there's no binding, we see the cyan because this YFP is too far away to be excited, but if there is binding, then we see yellow because they're linked together. FRET can also be used as a biosensor to detect local biochemical environments. So FRET can reveal a conformational change in a protein responding to a biochemical signal. And so these FRET biosensors are uh, made up of a CFP and a YFP. Uh, that are linked in the same fusion protein by a region that responds to a signal by changing conformation. Um, and normally they are too far apart for energy transfer uh, to occur to get that yellow fluorescence uh, until the link linking region ligand, which is this part right here, um, responds uh, to a signal by changing its conformation. Um, and then uh, once it does change its conformation, it brings that CFP and that YFP close together and allows that YFP to fluoresce uh, as yellow. And so uh, in this example, the biosensor signal reflects uh, the ratio of kinase to phosphatase activity in the local environment. And so as our example down in B here, uh, these FRET biosensing um, proteins for kinase, kinase A activity uh, were activated by the elevation of cyclic AMP, um, which was added to the cells at time zero. So here we added cyclic AMP uh, to the cells. Then images were collected at various times after the addition of uh, forscolin, which is a drug that induces the generation of more cyclic AMP and the activation of protein kinase A. And so this shows both the localization of pro, uh, protein kinase A as well as the rate of activation. So you can see this color change that occurs because those proteins are changing conformation over time um, based on this generation of protein kinase A.
or of cyclic AMP and protein kinase A. Uh, so another type of microscopy uh, called light sheet microscopy is able to image rapid events in living tissue. So the way this works is that a tissue sample that's living is illuminated from the side by a focused laser beam uh, that scans the sample to uh, generate a sheet of light, which is then observed uh, by this orthogonally placed detection objective. And so if we move the illumination and detection uh, objectives in this coordinated manner through the depth of the sample, we can generate a three-dimensional image. So we can use a biosensor with this light sheet microscopy to look at these rapidly changing events. And so in this example here, we have a uh, G cyclic AMP uh, calcium biosensor that has an N terminal and C terminal uh, of GFP uh, let me get my arrow here, um, that is uh, fused to a spacer polypeptide uh, that inhibits the GFP fluorescence because they're too far apart. The calcium binding protein, uh, calmodulin sensor domain, which is right here, oops, uh, is indicated in purple, is fused to the GFP's N-terminal domain and a calmodulin ligand domain, so it binds the uh, ligands, is fused to the C-terminal domain. Um, and in the presence of calcium, uh, the calmodulin binds four of these calcium ions. So in these four binding areas right here, and as you can see, the green uh, calcium has bound them down there. Um, and it causes this conformational change that allows it to bind to the ligand domain. So as you can see, this ligand domain that we had originally in yellow up here can now bind to that sensor domain by kind of uh, filling uh, the tube. And so when that happens, it brings the two GFP terminals together and allows for fluorescence to occur. So we can detect whether or not the sensor and the ligand binding domain are actually binding in the presence of calcium um, when things turn green. So this is what that example looks like with the calcium binding of the calmodulin uh, if we uh, were to use a red dye instead of a green dye that was in our last example. So we can see uh, throughout this um, living zebrafish brain cells uh, or brain tissue, uh, we can see the calcium being bound to the calmodulin. So in addition to light microscopy, we also have electron microscopy. And this uses, uh, utilizes high energy electrons that yield high resolution images. And thin specimens, uh, such as proteins or viruses, can be negatively stained or shadowed with heavy metals uh, for transmission electron microscopy, so to kind of look through them. Thicker material is fixed, dehydrated, plastic embedded sections, kind of like the microtome we talked about earlier, and stained with electrodense heavy metals for transmission electron microscopy. Specific proteins can be localized by TEM with specific antibodies associated with these heavy metal markers, um, which is a lot of times small gold particles. Uh, cryoelectric excuse me, cryo-electron microscopy allows examination of hydrated, unfixed, and unstained biological specimens. Um, so if we're not able to uh, use the microtome and, and fix these samples, we can use uh, cryo-electron microscopy. Uh, scanning electron microscopy, or SEM as opposed to TEM, um, of metal shadowed material reveals the surface features of a specimen. So SEM looks at the outside, TEM is transmission, so it's transmitted through the sample, and we can look at the uh, inside of tissues. So using TEM, we can look at uh, very fine uh, features of stained samples. So detailed shapes of single molecules, such as proteins or nucleic acids, or of structures uh, such as viruses uh, and their filamental uh, cytoskeleton, um, can be imaged using uh, transmission electron microscopy. 
So TEM samples are mounted on a small copper or gold grid that is covered with a very thin layer of plastic and carbon to which the samples can adhere because they have to stick to something. Uh, specimens are stained with a heavy metal such as uh, uh, urinal acetate uh, and excess stain is then washed away and removed so we don't get uh, kind of background uh, noise. And then a negative stain, uh, uh, here we have a negative stain of a, a rotavirus um, and so you can see kind of the resolution that you can get on these tiny, tiny uh, um, cells or structures. Um, so this is very uh, pertinent to today when I'm sure many scientists are looking at the uh, sh structure and shape of coronavirus and uh, trying to find uh, auto as much information as possible about it. So a technique um, for uh, surface details for TEM is what we call meadow, metal <laughs> shadowing. Um, and the way this works is the sample is spread on a mica surface um, and then dried in a, a vacuum evaporator. The sample grid is then coated with a very thin film of he heavy metal such as platinum or gold um, and then evaporated uh, from an electrically uh, heated metal filament. Um, so we have uh, this evaporated platinum that is used to coat our sample, which is this tan uh, uh, colored substance uh, right there. Um, the specimen is then coated with a carbon uh, film evaporant. So we have evaporated carbon uh, that is layered on top of the evaporated platinum. Uh, then the biological material is then dissolved by an acid uh, and a bleach. And then all we have is the shell or the casting of that biological material that we had before. Um, and so there's no living carbon-based cells anymore. All we have is the carbon film and the uh, platinum casting. Um, and so here uh, we have a uh, platinum shadow replica of the polio virus. And so that's kind of the resolution of images that you get from uh, shadow casting. So TEM can also look at thin sections um, so we can see kind of the inside or inner cell working, uh, workings. So in this case, an electron beam, um, an electron beam naturally has limited uh, penetrating power. So TEM samples are often fixed and embedded in a plastic and can cut uh, to either five uh, to a hundred on uh, nanometer sections, so using a microtome. Um, the section, uh, here we have the section through a uh, pancreatic cell, which is stained with heavy metals that bind to the cell uh, structures, showing the extensive rough ER. Um, so you can see this kind of uh, uh, rows of rough ER within the pancreatic cells. Um, and these are, uh, because they're pancreatic cells and the rough endoplasmic reticulum, uh, these are uh, structures that are involved with the synthesis and secretion of digestive enzymes. So using um, three-dimensional reconstruction, we can incorporate multiple electron microscopy images together to generate this 3D image uh, of uh, whatever it is what we're looking at. And so here we have an example of the Golgi complex of a cell um, that has been uh, uh, converted into a 3D image based on TEM uh, slides. And so the transport vesicles of the Golgi apparatus um, are uh, indicated here uh, as the white spheres um, and the cis membrane is the uh, light blue here. So SEM, or scanning electron microscopy, produces a three-dimensional image of a surface of an unsectioned specimen, as opposed to TEM, which we have sectioned specimens, and we can kind of look at the inside. Uh, SEM images of the surface of these unsectioned uh, metal-coated specimens by scanning the specimen with an intense electron beam that excites 
release of secondary electrons from the sample metal coating. So we're coating the sample with metal, exciting it with a beam. That beam then releases more electrons from that metal, which are then detected. Uh, the image appears three-dimensional because the number of secondary electrons produced at each point on the sample depends on the angle of the electron beam in, rotation, uh, in relation to the surface. So that 3D structure is because uh, samples that are uh, uh, flush to the electron beam are going to reflect more electrons back. Uh, whereas surfaces that are at an angle are going to deflect some of the electrons away. So you get this differential uh, kind of expression of electrons being reflected based on if the surface is flush or if it is um, facing away. And so you, uh, the, the detector then will um, take that information together to generate this kind of three-dimensional image. The last thing we're going to talk about um, looking at cell organelles. So disruption of cell by vigorous homogenization, sonication, and other techniques releases their organelles. So it breaks apart the outer membrane and lets the, um, the mitochondria or the uh, chloroplasts kind of be free. Um, swelling cells in a, a hypotonic solution weakens their plasma membranes, which makes it easier to rupture with homogenization or sonication. Um, after that, sequential differential centrifugation of a cell homogenate, so the disrupted cell um, lysate, uh, yields fractions of organelles that differ in mass and density. Uh, equilibrium density gradient centrifugation separates cellular component, components by density for purification. Uh, immunological techniques using antibodies against organelle-specific membrane proteins purify organelles and vesicles of similar sizes and densities, uh, and proteomic, anal proteomic analysis can identify all the protein components uh, in a preparation of a purified organelle. So um, there are different characteristics to each organelle that we can use to separate them if we want to say study only mitochondria or only uh, chloroplasts or only nuclei, etc. So this is very similar to the protein isol um, isolation uh, that we talked about in the previous chapter. Um, depending, because these organelles have different sizes and densities, spinning them at different speeds using differential centrifugation is a way that we can isolate them. So if you had a completely disrupted, homogenized cell base where you just have everything the cells are broken apart and everything's exposed. If we were to spin at 600 G for 10 minutes, then the pellet would be only nuclei, which are these, you know, the very big uh, solid structures uh, within the cell. If we were to uh, then take that lysate uh, or the supernatant and centrifuge that at 15,000 G for five minutes, then we'd have a fraction that has our organelles uh, like mitochondria and chloroplasts, lysosomes and peroxisomes. Um, we could then pour out the supernatant and spin for 100,000 Gs for 60 minutes and get plasma membranes um, and fragments of ER and things of that nature, etc. cetera. So um, by spinning for different amounts of time, and taking the lysates off of uh, each of these uh, salt, uh, these fractions, uh, we can isolate different parts of the cell. So just like with the protein isolation, we can also use density gradient uh, sensor, uh, centrifugation. Uh, and this is where we have a sucrose or a glycerol gradient um, of densities, where we have the most dense solution at the bottom, the least dense at the top and different organelles will settle into gradients um, that have equivalent density um, to themselves.